So for almost two years now, our personal and professional lives have been consumed by managing this pandemic. Uh, to kick this off, I thought it might put this consuming experience in some perspective if we consider caring for patients during or other pandemics in the past. I invite you to imagine being a doctor during four pandemics last year, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, and 200 years ago. Imagine you're a doctor 200 years ago in 1820. As today, people expect you to know what's wrong with them and how to treat it. You can diagnose plague and cancer and apoplexy and tetanus and gangrene and so on. The treatment might be to remove a bladder stone or to remove a gangrenous leg, or more commonly, it would be to treat the patient with laudanum or foxglove or some combination of stuff put together by the local pharmacist. These medical treatments are effective 30% of the time, and patients are very grateful. You must be a very wise doctor. This year, the plague that we're worried about is smallpox, a frightening and deadly disease. The treatment for smallpox, we all know, is bleeding. Now, you might wonder why, but it all depends on the basic science that we know about. All of the world is made up of only four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And the medical correspondence to those elements are bile, blood, and phlegm. If a patient has too much blood, uh, he might have sweating, he might be hot, he might be wet, and uh, very symptomatic in that way. And the way to treat it is to get rid of some of the blood. This happens all the time. Quite recently, a former president was bled for pneumonia. He died, died of the bleeding, not so much of the pneumonia. But this is what we do, and it doesn't always work, but it's our approach to, among other things, smallpox. As Galen says, this treatment is very effective if it works. If it doesn't, it's not a good treatment. So when smallpox occurs in a community, many people are infected and about 30% of them die at that time. Those who do not die are scarred for life with horrible scars and it affects everybody, including the Queen of England who had such ser serious smallpox scars that she always wore heavy makeup and does today in her modern depictions. That epidemic is uh, a pandemic if we were to count all the people in the world who have it. And this is just one year. It's been going on for over a thousand years. So this happens all the time. In this particular year, there are a million cases, 400,000 die and the fatality for this uh, condition is 30, 30%. Imagine if the COVID mortality was 30%. Now there's a country doctor in England named William, named Edward Jenner, who realized that uh, animals and people who were affected by the cowpox condition, uh, if they got that disease, this is a photograph from, it's a, it's a drawing from Jenner's book showing the pox on a udder of a cow. If they have this condition, they do not get smallpox. He thought that was really interesting. And in fact, he took some fluid from one of the cowpox pustules and injected it into a patient, didn't inject it, he scarified it on the surface of the skin because he didn't know about injection, no one did that. And that little boy did not get smallpox at the next time the epidemic came around. 
he called this uh, procedure vaccination after vaca, which is Latin for cow. By 1820, uh, every doctor has a little vaccination set and can give vaccination of cowpox to prevent smallpox. A disease has been entirely present, prevented for the very first time. Pretty encouraging. So a bit of science, but being a doctor uh, is mostly about caring, as John says, but here we have something to do in conjunction with the caring. Now imagine you're a doctor a hundred years later, 1918, 1920. People expect you to be able to diagnose their problems and to fix them one way or another. And you can diagnose all the things we could do before, but new conditions like scarlet fever or nephritis or microstenosis and scores of diseases, which we now know in 1920, are caused by bacteria and parasites. In a hundred years, medicine has learned that the axioms of science that we followed for a thousand years were all wrong, but now we know how organs work, how diseases occur, and we know that microbes, very small particles, bacteria, are responsible for many of those diseases that we thought were related to earth, air, fire, and water. The people who made these changes, we, could, we remember their names. Louis Pasteur is a Frenchman who discovered the role of bacteria in all of biology. He learned how to sterilize everything from a wire loop to milk. Uh, Robert Koch, a German, discovered that bacteria actually cause diseases, particularly tuberculosis and many others. Joseph Lister, a Scottish surgeon, discovered that wound infections were caused by bacteria and in fact can be treated by antiseptics and infection in the wound can be prevented by antiseptic materials. Here's a drawing of Lister operating on a patient uh, with a spray of phenol to keep the field sterile. The, the concept of asepsis is introduced by Lister. So you have a microscope in your office. You have laboratories and x-ray and anesthesia. Your hospital has a surgical suite where you can actually do sterile operations, quite amazing. You know that most of the infectious diseases are actually uh, caused by something carried by animals, either as vectors or they transmit the disease directly to humans, like influenza in birds and pigs. This year, there's an epidemic of influenza, and we recognize it. It's been around before. It begins in the World War I army bases. It spreads to the big cities quite quickly, and it's very contagious, and it's very serious. We know that the infection begins in a population, it goes up and up and up until we just shut the whole environment down and it goes back down again, only to start again at a later, later time. So the treatment uh, is to isolate the patients uh, and try to keep them from infecting other patients. So the, the treatment simply involves putting people to bed. Uh, there's no treatment, we're just helping them be more comfortable, but the mortality for this condition is 10%. Devastating problem. Imagine if the mortality for COVID were 10%. So since Jenner, 
doctors have experimented with giving a small amount of infectious material to healthy people, vaccination, to prevent uh, the onset of disease. And it works for smallpox, typhoid, cholera, works for influenza. So uh, we impanel a lot of helpers to vaccinate people with a, a vaccination that we have based on stuff from prior patients with influenza. And we did a lot of that in that year. Uh, however, it didn't work because we had the wrong material. Influenza disease acts like a bacterial lung infection, but we cannot find any responsible bacteria. If we culture blood or sputum uh, from a influenza patient and we culture it, we can culture a lot of bacteria, some of which seems to be the cause, but we use a device called the Chamberlain Pasteur filter. It's a long tube of porcelain. And if we run the fluid uh, through that device, what comes out is the filtrate and it has no bacteria in it. So what we have learned is that that filtrate causes the disease and in fact can be, a vac can be made into a vaccine, uh, but we don't know why. If we look at the statistics from that influenza epidemic in 1918, there were about 500 million people worldwide, 50 million died of it. Uh, and the fatality for that epidemic was 10%. Now imagine that you're a doctor in 2010, that's just 10 years ago. You probably were, all, most of you on this call. We have new ways of making diagnosis. We now the cause of disease is, now we know is many of these diseases are caused by viruses. Viruses were not discovered until 1935 when the scanning electron microscope came along, but we have learned that Many diseases are caused by viruses, and we even know what the viruses look like, and we give them names and so on, and we can prevent measles, mumps, chicken pox, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, and several more problems by developing vaccines that are uh, based on the family of viruses that that cause diseases. We're actually studying a vaccine that's intended to prevent cancer, believe it or not. Smallpox, that terrible plague, is one of these viruses, but it is gone. We've eliminated from the planet simply by vaccinating all the susceptible people in the world. We're getting good at it, so we're surprised when there's a, a new epidemic of influenza, despite vaccines have been going on. Uh, and it turns out that this is a new strain of influenza, we called it H1N1, which uh, has not been around for 50 or 60 years. So most of the population does not have any immunity to this particular virus. And so it is a major problem for the even for the people who were vaccinated. Uh, influenza occurs in the winter. So it hit first in Australia and New Zealand, and the ANZIC group studied it and reported their results so that those of us in the Northern Hemisphere would be ready for it in the winter. That group uh, did uh, some remarkable studies, but when they had patients who were uh, failing on mechanical ventilators and were referred to a few centers for ECMO. What they learned was more than half of those patients recovered just with good care, but 68 of them were failing, went on to ECMO, uh, a treatment that was used a lot in pediatrics, but occasionally in adults at the time. And 75% of those patients actually 
recovered, resulting in overall 86% survival in those hospitals that had ECMO capability. One of those was in, in Melbourne. And so here's the, the team in Melbourne. I happened to be there at that time. And uh, here's the ECMO machine. It's pretty simple. The nurse can uh, leisurely take care of the patient because it's not so frantic as it was caring for those patients just on a ventilator. Many studies came out of that pandemic. This is an, an example, patients in England who were uh, referred to ECMO capable centers versus centers that were not, and a big difference in outcome as you, as you all know. So here's the data from the influenza epidemic of 2010. 60 million people, 284,000 died, a mortality of 0.47% compared to the flu epidemic only 100 years before. And the difference is some of these patients were treated, others, that is the 2010 patients, others form the basically the control group. Now, you don't have to imagine being a doctor in 2021. Uh, we're living through this right now. We have this new disease. We uh, realize that this disease is as bad as smallpox. It's as serious as the 1918 flu. It acts like any viral pneumonia, but it's not caused by the influenza virus, even though it looks like it. It's caused by an entirely new virus called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, which appears to have generated from animals as these diseases usually do, but this is really a serious infection. Uh, managing patients in ICUs uh, is possible, but now the patient's very contagious. So we have to do this uh, with full protective garb to avoid catching the virus from those patients and spreading it around the hospital. ECMO works if the ventilator fails in these patients with about 50% recovery. So to the, the COVID epidemic, we're in the middle of it. So these numbers are not complete. But the important thing is we've learned that the mortality with all of our treatment uh, is about 2%. It's a very serious problem. This is where John Fraser and the COVID consortium <laughs> comes in. In 2019, John was president of the Asia Pacific chapter of ELSO. And when this condition first became apparent, it was in the Asian area. And John thought we better get ready for managing ECMO in these patients. It soon became obvious that they were so sick. The question wasn't ECMO. The question was, we need to learn something about this disease. So he put together this remarkable consortium of doctors, epidemiologists, statisticians from around the world, including all of you who are on this call. And now uh, we convene this group every month, as John says, and we get together so that John Luigi and Jackie and others can tell us what we're learning. Now we have the data to analyze, and that is the purpose of our meeting today. So we're ready to begin our symposium. I hope you found some perspective in this smattering of history. Being a doctor is uh, just as challenging as ever, uh, but our primary role has not changed. So enjoy the symposium. Thank you for the opportunity.